All right, Oppenheimer review. Oppenheimer was a very, very, very great movie. It is probably the best movie of the year. At least for me. It was definitely the best movie of the year. I don't know if my opinion may change at the end of the year with the winter blockbusters such as Killers of the Flower Moon and Napoleon and Wonka Dune 2 so I don't know if the rest of the movies at at the end of the year is not topless it's plausible but probably highly unlikely. Napoleon had a shot. Doors of the Flower Moon definitely had a shot. But yeah, I don't I really don't I don't think I just gonna top it. I, there is a chance. I'll give it I'll I'll leave enough room for the possibility. I am looking forward to all the winter blockbusters for sure. Oppenheimer was so beautifully told. It was a wonderful story. I loved the amount of irony that was in this movie. There was a lot of irony in it. Mm. I, 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 I can't tell you how many, because I don't want to spoil too much. I can't tell you how many times they use the irony in their message multiple times, especially at the end. Down, very, 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 very careful not to spoil anything. There's a moment in the beginning, and there's a moment in the at the end, which is a big irony. Uh, it was almost like Robert Oppenheimer was looking in a mirror at what Robert Oppenheimer could have been. If that makes sense. For those of who have seen the movie, we probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a moment in the beginning, and there's a moment at the end, which brings up the word irony. But there's a lot of other irony moments in this movie, for sure. Uh, I also loved how historically accurate this movie was. It was probably the most for me, it was the most historically accurate war movie ever told. Uh, I, I don't recall any war movie ever being this accurate that I have seen. I've seen a lot of accurate war movies. And the craziest thing about this is, yes, it is a war movie. But the craziest thing is there's hardly any war imagery in it there's there is none there is no war imagery in this movie other than other than what oppenheimer is uh seeing in his head uh or foreseeing the future or whatever you want to call it uh his prophecy or whatever whatever you want to call it his imagination seeing the possibilities of things going wrong constantly in his head. He's constantly, re, you know, you see, like, it's not a flashback, but it's, you know, he's, poor, he's foreshadowing or foreseeing how stupid human beings are. So, the, uh, you know, so he's, so I, I guess that's probably the only war imagery you might probably see in the movie. Is his imagination, but other than that, it's 
it's a dialogue movie. It, uh, it, <laughs> it has this uh, documentary biopic feel to it. It flows like Oliver Stone's JFK. It has that kind of flow to it. Uh, I'm not the hugest fan of Christopher Nolan. That being said, this is definitely my favorite Christopher Nolan movie. Second being Dunkirk. There are so many people in this movie. A lot of them, a lot of the cast I already knew because of the common attractions. I and when, when it comes to the trailers or common attractions, however you want to call them, I I only watched the teaser and the first trailer. I avoid at all costs. I avoid every other trailer after that. I even avoid watching YouTube videos where people are talk discussing the, the newest trailer. The newest trailer. Sometimes. Sometimes I don't avoid it because I'll probably forget what they said anyway. So, you know. So, it depends. It depends on if I, but I definitely won't watch a trailer. That being said, there were so many people in this movie. There were people in this movie that I didn't even know was in the film. Like Gary Ullman. I did not know Gary Ullman was in the film at all. And he's only in the film at the end. He plays Harry S. Truman. <laughs> that dude, Gary Ullman, is one hell of an actor. And the makeup that they used on him to make him look like Harry S. Truman was phenomenal. The, his, his acting chops, his acting ability to play Harry S. Truman is also phenomenal. That shouldn't be surprising considering that he played Winston Churchill. I, mean, I loved almost every movie this guy has done. From Fifth Element to... Dracula, Bron Braun Strucker's Dracula. Harry Potter, of course. I mean, and then he's retiring soon after Slow, uh, was it a TV show called Slow Horses? I, I think that TV show is called, it's on Apple. But he's retiring after that. And bless him. Man, he, he has had one hell of a career. If he's going to go out on Oppenheimer and Slow Horses. <laughs> kudos. <laughs> I'm going to miss him. I'm sure in the hell is going to miss him. But damn, if he's going to go out on Oppenheimer and Slow Horses. Hmm. What a great ending for his career. There was a lot, of, as, I, as I said before, there was a lot of people in this movie that I knew were in it. I knew Josh Peck was going to be in this movie. Those of you who, who don't know who Josh Peck is, uh, he's from Drake and Josh. Those of you who don't, also don't know, he's Jewish. I uh, wish his, char his character was playing. He was also Jewish. Um... Another Jewish actor that was in this movie, uh, who I liked that they had him in the movie, was uh, the actor that played, I don't remember his name right now, I feel bad, but he played, uh, he, he played Bernard in Santa Claus uh, with Tim Allen. And yes, he's Jewish, and he played in a movie called Santa Claus. That's because he enjoys both holidays. He's openly talked about how he enjoys both Christmas and Hanukkah. He he loves both Christian and Judaism. To the point that, if I recall correctly, he said openly that he married somebody that was Christian just to be able to enjoy Christmas. Then go over to all his parents. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I I really like him. He's really cool. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, and Robert Downey Jr. was amazing in this too. It, it, his role was beyond amazing. Probably the best role he's ever done for me. Is probably his best role ever is in this movie Oppenheimer. And <laughs> it's right up there. His best roles are this one right here with Oppenheimer being his best one. Charlie Chaplin is one of our best roles. There's Sherlock Holmes and Iron Man. So in no particular order, those are his best roles and this one is probably his the best role that he's ever played. I, after watching this movie, I am, it is, for me, it is very odd for me to say this, as someone who deeply, very deeply cares about the environment, I'm very passionate about the environment, so this is very odd for me to say, but I respect the hell out of Robert Oppenheimer. Julius Robert Oppenheimer. I respect the hell out of him. Other than the fact that he invented the atomic bomb. <laughs> hmm. See, you see how odd that is. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I care deeply about the environment. And yet, I admire somebody that created the bomb. Hmm. But when you see this movie, I mean, he's a very complex person. Uh, there's this one person in the film who even describes him very, almost perfectly. <laughs> it's like, I, he, they didn't get along, but at the end of the day, they respected each other. And then and at, the, at a certain point, at the end of the movie, the kind of, the the character the other character that was working with Oppenheimer it came full circle in a way because it's like you know what I we butted heads so many times but he's not a bad person <laughs> uh, it's like so it's like this guy he, he I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give it away it's like you know he's like just not the exact lyrics that he the, the dialogue he used but. Lyrics. I don't mean lyrics, dialogue. Not the exact dialogue he used, but but it, it basically he's implying that we, we didn't get along. I left because we didn't get along. But I come to realize that he was right, and that he's also a good person. I mean, again, this is not the exact dialogue, but, <laughs> you know, he's not the person you think he is. Uh, again, there's this, again, there's another part of the movie. And there's another video I'm going to do later about labels. Uh, and the reason I bring up labels now is because one of the things that I loved about the movie is that they really educated people on what it means to be a communist, what it means to be a fascist, etc, etc. And I loved every time Oppenheimer would say, never join the party. I never join the party. Robert, are you uh, a commie? Nope, never join the party. I loved it. I love that remark. I never joined the party. But on the topic of labels, and I'll do another video about labels later, pinning that li that stupid label communist on him was the biggest insult to, his, to, to who he was as a person. Basically, in this movie, and then I'm not going to give anything away, they, they pretty much screwed him over. 
Uh, it's, uh, the, uh, I, again, I don't want to spoil any of the movies, so I'm trying really hard. Uh, they, they pretty much screw them over toward the end of the movie. And you really feel bad for him. And they keep throwing this false label on him that he's a communist. Which he's not. And I love the fact that they really showed you the truth of why it educated you, basically, of what, what a communist is. And it gave, it also, the movie showed you, like, the birth of the McCarthy era, in a way. Uh, it explained to you, like, how people can be a communist and, and then later leave the party, you know, because they got cold feet. But just because someone did join the party doesn't mean that they are definitive a communist. You know, no. You could join a party and then leave. It, does, it doesn't define you. It, it labels, labels shouldn't define you. It is our characteristics that are who we really are. Very similar to what Martin Luther King said at the end of the speech about judging people based on our character. You know, so not the color of our skin, but the color of our character. I mean, I, I I'll pull up the speech later, but I mean, I brought this up before, uh, not on the videos, but in, in person. I I mentioned. How the end of his speech is probably the most important part of the speech. Because I had a dream. I don't recall it right this second, but but I I do know of it and I have talked about it openly. Um, not on videos, but in public chat and stuff like this. You know, if the person's character is more important. Than their skin color, you know, is it's the characteristics that should be judged, and not the person's skin. Is basically what uh, I have a dream speech was. Anyway, got a little off track, but in any case, I really. I loved how, I loved what they were doing in this movie. I love, also, I loved how, I loved how they were, I'm trying to think of how I want to phrase it, because I don't, I don't want to spoil the movie. I loved how, like I said, they were going, they were showing you how we transitioned from from accusing Robert Oppenheimer of being a communist to the McCarthy era. I also loved how that they showed you that just because you weren't born, just because you weren't born yet, doesn't mean that communist was never practiced. A lot of people today insist on trying communism again. Or it's or just on saying that we never did it. Uh, no, we did do it. Just because you weren't born for it doesn't mean it never happened. It was on the ballot. <laughs> Communism was indeed on the ballot. We tried it. It didn't work. Move on. <laughs> People today are like, I want to be a we never asked, we, we never did communism. Why can't we try it? We did try communism. Read the book. <laughs> so. so. I love that, that they really educate you on the fact that we've already tried it. It was, a, it was on the ballot. 
know, they educate people with that. I love the fact that they educated people on the history of the McCarthy era. Of this whole witch hunt thing of targeting people because they were or are a communist. You know, stupid bullshit like that. I also love, um, before we end this video, because it's getting up to 20 minutes already, uh, I also loved that they told you in this movie multiple times that these things that they were doing, the president of the United States has nothing to do with it. What do you want to call it? Secret government or secret organization or whatever you want to call it. The CIA, the FBI, the secret administration or whatever, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what words to use for this. But the Secret Service, there you go, Secret Service, whatever they're doing secretly in our country, that's who I'm talking about. Uh, I love how they mentioned in this movie multiple times that it's none of the president's business. We don't care about his campaign. We don't care about how it affects his campaign. We don't care about the American people. We are doing this for America. But we don't care about how it may or may not affect the American people. We don't care if the president doesn't like what we're doing. It is none of his business. They had multiple times when they had kind of delivered that message multiple times to pretty much get it into your head that, that any of these secret things have nothing to do with, with the president like testing a nuclear bomb in the middle of a desert you know it's not it, it kept like I said they kept saying it's, you know they were asking should we tell the president and they were like no it's none of his business but we don't care about his campaign. We don't care about how it would affect his campaign or how people would, if they were to find out that we're blowing up things in the desert. If, if, people, if the American people found out that we're blowing things up in the desert, we don't give a shit on how it would affect his campaign. You know, how people might not trust the president or whatever. It's, you know... What bothers me, well, it doesn't, it bothers me, it doesn't bother me. It's kind of a catch-22 thing. It's annoying. We limit our power to what the president can and can't do. Which is rightly so. It's rightly so that the president can't have all the power. I agree with that. I agree that the president can't have unlimited power. That being said. If the president has unlimited power, then how come this secret organization, this secret service, or whatever you want to call it, has all the power? That never, that, that never made sense to me. How come they get to do whatever the fuck they want to do, whether for the greater good or for the wrong reasons? Why do they get to do, why, why is... Uh, they hold our future into balance. Why do they get a say of what they can do to our country that may or may not affect everyone on the planet or everyone in this country? For example, and if you think that the government has never done experiments on American citizens, you'd be wrong. 
the government has done experiments on civilians. But then, without the president's knowledge. I know it's hard for people to comprehend that, but it's the truth. The president has no control or say so, which is ridiculous to me. Because I understand how a president can have all the power. But if a president does not want you blowing up fucking nuclear bombs in the middle of the desert, then the president should have a say in that, I think. I don't know. If the president found out that you're doing experiments on civilians, and he doesn't like that, then he or she should have the right to tell them no. But for whatever reason, they do not discuss things with the president. They just go on to their merry business, doing whatever. Now, if you were, you're probably asking, what experience did they do on American citizens? Well, for those of you who have watched Identical Strangers, know what I'm talking about. For those of you who have not seen the documentary Identical Strangers, the gist is this. It was a, a experiment on twins. Twin study experiments. And what it was, long story short, was basically that they ran tests on infants that were twins, separated them at birth, put them in separate homes, uh, whether uh, different classes, whether it be lower middle class, upper class, rich, what have you. Everybody with all these twins were pretty much separated based on class, separated for all different reasons besides just class. And they would send people in to, you know, pretty much like a psychiatrist would read and do tests with the kids, basically, uh, seeing how they how they evolve as people or whatever, you know, they'll take notes. photos. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that they did with this, with this twin study. And you have to watch the documentary to get a full understanding of what I'm talking about. It's called Three Identical Strangers. It's a real story. It's on truth. Three real people who are identical twins who have never met each other into one day one of them, it started out like one of them met, you know, met each other by accident, and another one found, you know, the newspapers, and then the third one found each other from the newspaper. Uh, it's a really fascinating story, and I really feel for these people, these three kids. Uh, well, they're not kids anymore, they're adults now, and I, uh, one of them died or committed suicide. So, I know killing yourself is not the answer. However, unless you experience the things that he has experienced in his life, you can't really say that one shouldn't kill himself. He shouldn't have killed himself. Uh, he should never have thought he should have killed himself. However, I'm just saying, the, if you, unless you experience someone's actual trauma throughout life, unless you experience their life, you can't really say that they shouldn't, should or shouldn't have killed themselves. You know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes, kind of thing. <sighs> 
Well, yeah, I really, <laughs> I really, really love this movie. I loved how it was told. It was, it was this, the story was told very well. Uh, the three hours flew by. It, it didn't, if anything, it felt like a two hour movie. Now, your bladder might feel differently. Your bladder might be feeling like it is a three hour movie. What the hell are you talking about? But viewing it, watching it, your brain, whatever, up here and viewing it, everything else didn't feel like a three hour movie. It felt like a two hour movie. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I loved how it was told. Favorite Christopher Nolan movie to date. So yeah, I I really love this movie. I love the irony, as I said before, in this movie. I love that they covered a lot of things from everything from, like I said, not telling the president what's going on, uh, dropping these bombs, Robert Oppenheimer understanding the problems of being a human, being a human being. And uh, he understood that a human being is complex. He understood that a human being is very easily capable of making a mistake, a mistake that they would instantly regret. He was, he understood, he understood how a human being is, or what a human being is capable of, basically. So, I mean, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I highly recommend it. Definitely go see it. On a side note, in case you're wondering about the tin, My bladder cancer awareness pin, because uh, my dad has cancer, and so I'm wearing that, um, uh, respect for him. Um, but anyway, back on the movie, yeah, it was really good, and I'm going to leave the video at that. Not much I can say other than I love the special effects, I love the story, I love the cast, the cast is phenomenal. Robert Oppenheimer is complex, but a really cool, interesting person. I like him. I admire him. I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, is he perfect? No, but the, the, that's the point. Nobody's perfect. Everybody has flaws. Everybody is capable of doing stupid shit. We're all human. 